Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're continuing on in our study of First Timothy. And hooray. 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 <laughs> Amen. Hooray. And we left off last week uh, in the second chapter. And I'm going to pick up there because I'm, we're going to do something a little bit different to start off today. Okay. Before I start, remember that we encourage you to write to us at office at BibleTalk.com with any questions, comments, or suggestions you might have. And I also want to encourage you to have the ability to take little notes while we do this, all right? Because I pray that during the course of the study, something strikes you that you're going to want to go back and check to make sure I'm telling you the truth and or to speak to the Lord more about because, you know, you, you know that God has more for you on some point, all right? all right? But before we do any of that, Brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time together. Yes. <clears throat> now, Lord, we thank you for your word. And it says where two or three are gathered in your name, you will be here also. And Lord, just depart your wisdom to us so we can live the life that you want us to live and spread your word. Amen. Amen. All right. The reason this is a little bit different, uh, if you were with us last week, if you weren't, by the way, you can go back and look at all of these on, on the Bible Talk website, BibleTalk.com. But if you were, you know that we were talking about the fact that we closed uh, about how we determine what our lifestyle is, all right? And that's a, a kind of a broad way of putting it. But I was saying there's a, a real competition between the word and the world, mm -hmm. all right? And it has, been, it has been written into law in the United States of America by more than one ruling, but one ruling in particular from the Supreme Court of the United States that talked about when they were do uh, it was a uh, Miller versus California case, I think, where they were debating how to determine what is obscene and what's pornographic. And what they finally resolved was, and this is what is now written into the law. As a matter of fact, I have a quote, okay? Why don't you quote it? Okay, I think I will. This is, this is a quote from the Supreme Court of the United States. Something is obscene or something is pornographic based on whether the, and this is a quote, whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find the work taken as a whole appeals to purian interest. So in other words, what they're saying is if the community thinks it's all right, then it's all right. That's the standard of law in the United States of America. Community standard. And I said as we closed, you know, I quoted it a number of times in the book of Judge, Judges. It talks about the fact that when there was no king in Israel, every man did what was right in his own eyes. When they speak of a king, they're talking about the king, the king of kings, the lord of lords, right? And when the people came, the Jewish people came to the prophet Samuel, in Ramah, and said, give us a king that we might be like the other nations. God says, that's what you want? That's what I'll give you. But he said to Samuel, Samuel, don't you get upset. Mm. They haven't rejected, they haven't rejected you. you. They have rejected me as being king over them. Our political system here, and basically throughout the world, is a rejection of God being king over us. So therefore, we do whatever is right in our own eyes. Mm -hmm. What determines community standards? Well, I'll tell you what com determines community standards. Whatever the majority thinks is best. Majority rules. Majority rules. I mean, that's, that's the community. Whatever the majority of people thinks. It's okay. It's okay. Now, that, there's a problem with that just based on a very simple statement that Jesus made. He said that the, the, the wide is the gate and easy is the road. It leads to destruction, and many are those who will follow it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. In other words, Jesus is making a flat statement that the majority of people are going to not take the way of the Lord. Right. Okay? So whenever there's a majority, 
There's a red flag. There's, there should be red flag. Let me just say this. Have you ever heard this description of a, a democracy? Two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner. Right. And this country was predicated on the majority knows best. Well, that's the world system. It's not just this country. No, but this right. country participates in the world system. It, it almost started the... No, 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 no. It started in France. Democracy? Well, it's divided yeah. way back in Greece. Democracy is a Greek philosophy. It started, it was given birth in Greece. It's uh, at a time when God was speaking through his prophets, saying, you know, don't be, don't be swayed, don't be, don't be learning from Greek philosophy, don't from philosophy. Because, you know, th this is harsh, and I don't really want to get distracted on this, but the simple fact of the matter is, and I was talking to Alice about this the other day, uh, because we are led by a dictator. Yes. That's correct. Now, that sounds harsh to people, but the simple fact of the matter is, that's the truth. And if you can't handle that truth, I don't know what to tell you. God says it, we do it. That's, right. that's, a, that's by definition a dictator. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that he's a benevolent dictator, Satan has done everything in his power to try and get us to think that dictator in and of itself is evil. Mm -hmm. And he has put forth people like Mussolini, like, like Hitler, like Stalin. And these are, I mean, ungodly dictators who are, well, that, that's fact, they're evil. But the fact that dictator is not evil, it just depends on whether he's a good dictator or a bad dictator. And there is one good dictator, and that is the Lord God Almighty. We are led by, ruled by his word, whatever he says. Okay? So so get over it. I mean, because either we're going to, this is the problem, okay? It doesn't matter what, what all of the people, what, what people agree on. You know, it says, Paul said, let every man be a liar, but the guy be found true. It doesn't matter how many people disagree with God. That's his, 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 his kingship is not up for vote. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is supreme. Yes. That's a fact. Whether you like it or not, it's a fact. And you can find that out the easy way or the hard way, right? So the problem is then with culture that whether you're a man, woman, boy, or girl, it is the God-breathed scripture, the word of God, that determines how you should behave. That's right. Not the community standards. Not the community standards. Not social media, not, not modern music, not television reality program. Reality, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the word of God that instructs you on how you should act according to your gender. Yes. And that's what we talked about last week. All right? The difference between between your biological sex, which is just, you know, you are. God created a male and female. He created them. You're either a male or a female. But that's not the determination of a gender, because the gender is about what, the way you think. Mm -hmm. Okay? So when we're born again, we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. There are so many commands in the Word of God, and it speaks against the effeminate. It speaks against homosexuality. It, God gives you instruction on how a man is supposed to act. God gives you instruction on how a woman is supposed to act. Yes. God gives instruction on how a boy or girl is supposed to act. Mm -hmm. All right? That is what determines, you know, whether you, you can be a man and not act like a man. That's right. Which is why the Word of God, the Apostle Paul said, act like men. Mm -hmm. Now, that's important here. And the reason we got into it last week is because going into where we are in Timothy, ending in, in the second chapter and going into the third chapter, that's what... God is doing through the Apostle Paul. He is training us on how we are to behave. All right? Mm -hmm. Let me just say this. I want to, I, I, I do want to say this. <laughs> In Jeremiah 10, God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah, and he said, listen. No, he didn't say listen. I'm paraphrasing. Right? He said, do not learn the ways of the nations, the goyim, whatever, however your translation reads, but he's saying, don't learn from the unbelievers. Don't learn from the unbelievers. Now, this may be an aside, but I pray that you hear what I'm going to say. Mommy and daddy, if you're sending your children off to government schools, the worldly schools, 
What are they going to learn but worldly ways? And then you're befuddled by the way they act. Mm-hmm. How they behave. And the way they behave. Well, you sent them off to be trained that way. Mm-hmm. Shame on you. You need to train up your child in the ways they should go. Fathers, go read what God says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 about what you're supposed to do with your children. All right. We are to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and do not lean on our, your own understanding. That's what it says in Proverbs 3, 5. So it's not about how you understand things. It's about how God says things are. And, and where do you learn this? Well, in Psalm 119, it begins right with this. Now, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. It's all about God's word. But in, in verse 9, it says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. If you want to be living right, thinking right, acting right, behaving right, you better be doing it according to God's word. It also says in that, in Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We're supposed to be guided by God's word. Okay? This is the instruction manual. It is abs- it's the manufacturer's handbook. That's right. He made yes. it. He knows how it's supposed to work. But there is a saying, I wish kids would come with an instruction manual. No, I heard an ad like that, and that upset me so much because, you know, they do. You have a child? It came with an instruction book. It's called the Bible. And if you don't use it, shame on you. Now, this is not about what Paul thinks, by the way, what we're reading, right? Peter said, I'm going to read you a verse from Peter, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. God's word gives instruction to men, then to women, then to the overseers, and then to the deacons, right here in 1 Timothy. All right? It's an order. It, it is. I mean... Where we ended last week in First Timothy chapter 2, uh, he started talking about, in verse 8, he says, I, Therefore I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Mm-hmm. And then he goes on in verse 9 and says, Likewise, that women are to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided. He's going on, so he's giving instruction to the men. Then he gives instruction to the women. And then if you go on, and I... I ask you, please go on. This is your homework assignment for the week. Go on and read all through chapter 3. Because he says, then it's a trustworthy statement of any man aspires to the office of an overseer. So now he's talking about the overseers. He talked about the men, talked about the women. Now he's talking about the overseers. Then he goes on to talk about deacons. And he's talking about how they, they're supposed, what their character should be and what their behavior should be. Because that's what I mean, you know, you can hold the office and not do this. The same way that a man can be born a man and biologically be a man, but not act like a man. So an overseer, there's plenty of people sitting in that in that office in churches, and they are not acting like it, not according to the word of God. Same thing with deacons, right? This is the instruction. Now, the reason I'm not going to go through that verse by verse is because the scriptures are full of that. Mm-hmm. What you need to do, and you need to do this, is you need to search the scriptures. You need to go to the Lord and say, I want, I am this, I want to, I want to be that the way you desire I be that. And start leading, because the scriptures is full with instruction on how a man should act. I mean, it goes back before they were coming into the promised land, right? And Moses had died. And what's the first thing that God speaks to Joshua, who has appointed to take that position? He says, be, he, first he gives him a vision of the promise. He said, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to do all that he has instructed, all that his word says. There's so much instruction for women, how they're supposed to behave. In, all right? And I promise you, it's not what you're going to find on the, the, women's, the reality shows on television. It's not what you're going to find in most of the music. It's not what you're going to find on the adverts on the television. Mm-hmm. 
but it's God's desire for you because this is, he came that you would have joy. Your joy would be made full. He came that you had abundant life. If you do it God's way, you'll have that. You do it the world's way, you're going to wind up miserable. That's the truth, right? So he goes on and he says that, right? Talking about the overseers, talking about the deacons. And in verse 15, chapter 3, verse 15, he says, in case I'm delayed, he said, I, I write to you so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. The reason that we're studying this, the reason that Paul wrote it, is so that we would know how to act and how to behave. But again, remember I said no scripture was, no prophecy of scripture was by any man's will. Mm -hmm. This is God speaking through the Apostle Paul. Okay, you need to know the truth. How are you going to know the truth? Abiding in the word. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. If you're not abiding in God's word, you will easily be deceived by that liar by nature, that father of lies, who has in his control the world system. And you're going to pay attention to what you see on the television, what you see in the movies, what you see in the adverts. And all of a sudden, you know what? You're not going to be acting in the eyes of God. You're not going to be acting as he desires you to. <clears throat> He's going to make you free. Free from what? The lies, the ungodly culture of this present world. The fables. And it yes. is. I'm telling you, this: the, the, the culture of this world today is a cesspool. It's a cesspool. You're going to be free from living a life that's guided by the wickedness of the evil one who only desires that you have misery and death. That's what it says, right? So many people, male and female, young and old, are slaves to the culture of today. Slaves to the culture of today. They see, a woman sees that dress on the television, you've got to have it. A guy sees a beer commercial that shows you what a manly man is, you've got to be that. You know what? Jesus Christ can set you free because only Jesus Christ, he's made you a man or he's made you a woman, but he can only he can make you act like one. That's about the gender you are. Okay. This, well, this is, these are perilous times. Yes, they are. And this is, I tell you, I mean, this is an ugly world. It, it's an, it, it is an, it was a beautiful earth. <laughs> yes. All right. It's sin polluted. Okay. And, but it's been, it's been polluted. It's been corrupted, right? Mm -hmm. I don't find it, uh, this may, I got to be really prayerful how I say this. I don't find it pleasant to live in this culture. Mm -hmm. And when I say this culture, you know, I've lived in cultures. We've lived in Central America. We've lived in Europe. We've lived in England. We've lived in, I've spent a lot of time in Africa. I just don't find the culture pleasant to be around. You didn't spend enough time in 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 Israel to really feel the culture. Oh, I felt the culture. Well, but did, did, you, but did you feel it? I mean, I, I had the opportunity. I don't know that a lot of people have this opportunity. I was invited to go to Israel. I didn't go there as a tourist. And I was invited to go there <clears throat> by a very brilliant Bible scholar, Jewish, conservative Jewish, not, not Christian, Jewish scholar who invited me to go there, and I spent three days staying at his home. Alice and I did, with him and his wife. And he and I sat at the kitchen table, basically for three days, and discussed scripture. It, it was, I got a world of knowledge out of it. I'm, you know, uh, But does that Space. represent the nation of Israel? And would you be more comfortable in the nation of Israel than here? Well, the idea is that, yeah, you should be. Uh, the simple fact that I'm at, well, I felt it, right at home. Israel is God's chosen land. Yeah. Yeah. That is the land, Haaretz. That that is the land. That's where Jesus was born, lived, and that's where Jesus is coming back to. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, 
<laughs> and I listen I, to all to my Jewish friends, to the Jewish friends who are not yet believers in the promised Messiah of Israel who has come, who is, who was, and who is yet to come. You better get your act together and start thinking about the fullness of the promise of God to deliver you a Messiah and then go read how the Messiah would come on his terms and not on yours. Jesus was rejected because he didn't meet the ideals of the culture. He did not come as a conquering king to throw the Romans out. He came as a humble servant. All right? But... If there is any nation that is different in the earth, it is the, Israel, it is the nation of Israel. But that does not mean by any means that their culture right now is it's godly. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just okay. going to say, it's God's culture that yeah. we're home with. Yeah. That's the only culture that's going to get better. That's right. Well, <laughs> that, that's the only, you know, I've said many times, uh, I'm a skeptic, first of all, okay? And it's not bad to be a skeptic. It's bad to be a cynic. Mm -hmm. It's not bad to be a skeptic. A skeptic is somebody who tests things to see if they're true. Right? And the Word of God says that we're to examine all things and hold fast that which is good. Not to speculate. Right. I'm an optimist. But I happen to be a realistic optimist. Yeah. And based on the Word of God, no, I don't expect to see things getting better and better. Yeah. I expect to see things getting worse and worse and worse as we grow closer and closer to the great and terrible day of the Lord. Yes. Okay? But it's what's beyond that that is glorious, that next coming of the Lord, okay? So I have an optimism about the work of Jesus Christ. And you know what? He's not going to lose one that the Father has given him. No. And at the end, the devil has no hope of victory. He is an absolute stupid head because he thinks he can, and he can't. Because Christ has already won the victory, the triumph. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book. It's my opus. It's going on forever and ever. But someday, we'll see. And it's called The Schemes of the Devil and the Triumph of Christ Jesus. We're not to be unaware of the schemes of the devil. We're not to be unaware of what he is and who he is and what he's doing. But by the same token, he's been conquered. I mean, when Jesus on that cross triumphed over the devil, Christ was publicly displayed as crucified. Satan was publicly displayed as disarmed. But I'll tell you what, if you're a Bible believer, you've got to see that things are going to get worse before he returns. Right. You know, it's like we're growing close to that time when Jesus said it's like the, at the times of Sodom and Gomorrah mm, yes. and the times of Noah, right? Mm. That's what it's getting like. But, but think about what Peter wrote, speaking of Lot in, in Sodom, all right? In the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. Peter wrote, 2 Peter 2, I'm going to read verses 7 and 8. And he, if he rescued Lot, righteous Lot, that says, oppressed by the sensual conduct of the unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Lot was tormented by the lawlessness around him. Right? Mm -hmm. When Paul left Ephesus and went through Berea and went, was going, went to Athens, right? When it says when he was waiting, he was waiting for Silas and Timothy at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols, Acts 17, 16. And, and even Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. When Jesus, it says, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you, and hem you in on every side. Luke 19, 41 to 43. Jesus wept over them. Lot was tormented. <coughs> Paul was provoked. It's no fun to be in the midst of this ungodliness that just abounds. Everywhere you look, there's ungodliness. And if you find that pleasant to be around, well, you better examine yourself. 
Now, the, thank God, as opposed to what democracy and the Enlightenment said, and is in our Constitution here in the United States about the pursuit of happiness, God tells us not, he doesn't say to pursue happiness, God says pursue righteousness. And he has given us the gift, the fruit of the Holy Spirit that is joy. And there is a substantial difference between joy and happiness. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of this provocation, in the midst of this cesspool, you can still have the joy of the Lord. And you need the joy of the Lord because it is the joy of the Lord that is your strength. Because that's because we have our eyes fixed on him. We have our eyes fixed on him. Yeah, I mean, see what it said now? Um, Jesus said, the things of God, the things that make for peace have been hidden from your eyes. Mm -hmm. Talking to the ones that haven't received it. Mm -hmm. But Jesus, when he came, said, and this is a, a famous quote. It was his first sermon, so to speak. He said, he's quoting Isaiah. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he was, has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. When you fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, you will see the glory of God beyond all of the nonsense, all of the evil. And that's what we need. And that's why. You because how, how can you live without that? Mm. I mean, we, the, the world is just a place of utter, absolute misery. It's warfare. It's wars and rumors of wars. It's famines in diverse places. It is just evil everywhere you look. Unless you fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of your faith. You set your mind on the things above and your eyes on Jesus Christ, okay? It is our only hope. So that's why I said, <laughs> I'm not going to go into all the details about, about this. Um, you need to find, because I don't know what you are. I mean, you know, it's, whether you're a male or female, whether you're an overseer or a deacon, or if you're the sweeper in the church, every Christian has a ministry. You need to find out how God says you should behave, behave how you should think, how you should act, how, how you should, should behave, how you should speak. And it, that's the instruction for life. Mm. Amen. This is a handbook for life. Use it that way. Mm. Use it to find the fullness of life in Christ Jesus. Okay. I, I said, you know, I, I'm going to close on a verse that I read there, 1 Timothy 3.15. Paul, in writing, talking about he wants to come to them, but he says, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. The church is the presence of God and the evidence of his love and redeeming grace. That is a message for all of us. We are all ambassadors for Christ. We are all the, the believers, the bondservants of the Most High God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, bringing the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus in every place. We are the salt that still brings flavor and preserves what's left of the world. We are the light that shines in the darkness of this world. We need to learn from the Word of God how to behave and act like that. The world can't teach you that. The world doesn't want to teach you that. The world will not teach you that. But the Word of God will. So, Father, we thank you for your Word. Above all, Father, we thank you for your Word made flesh who dwelt among us. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus who did for us what we could never do for ourselves, to be right with you. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your power. We thank you, Lord, that you can use us to touch other lives with this good news. Lord, that people can be redeemed from the ugliness of this world and come into the fullness of joy, prepared to live in eternity with you. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Amen. That was half an hour. Oh, my goodness gracious. Ah. Flies when you're having fun. Write to us. Office at BibleTalk.com. Love you. God bless you and goodbye till next time. Of your
Michael.